So our panel uh, this afternoon, uh, the first panel is on climate change and water resources. Uh, so my esteemed colleagues here, uh, uh, Dr. Kate Brubaker, who is a hydrologist with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Please raise your hand so they know who you are. Uh, second speaker after Dr. Brubaker would be Dr. Ali Sadiqi, who is a soil scientist uh, and does lots of hydrology watershed type work with uh, laboratory called the Hydrology and Remote Sensing Lab of BARC, USDA, uh, ARS here. And our third uh, speaker in the panel would be Dr. Vicky Chance, who is, uh, who is one of the faculty members in the uh, Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture. And the um, fourth speaker would be Dr. Paul Liesner, who is uh, one of the faculty members in the Department of Environmental Science and Technology at the University of Maryland. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Hubert Montas as the fifth speaker, uh, who is uh, uh, who is with the Department of Bioengineering in the College of Engineering at the University of Maryland. Uh, so two colleagues from College of Engineering, and uh, Dr. Montas and I used to be with the Biological Resource Engineering. So his background is on uh, watershed transport processes, computation, decision support system, and so forth, so applied to ecosystem level and, and uh, sort of cellular level. And uh, then the last one would be me, so I can learn what they say, so I can say which ones they missed, you know, I'm just kidding. But I, uh, so I am, I am by training an agricultural biological and agricultural engineer, and, and most of my research has been on water management, watershed hydrology, water quality, and I have, as I mentioned earlier, I have, had, uh, I have been fortunate to have lots of collaboration with my ARS scientist colleagues here in Belsville for many years, for 27 years. And so with that, our first speaker is Dr. Kate Brubaker, please. Um, as I said, I'm a, a hydrologist and hydroclimatologist. And what I want to talk about with you today here is to launch this thing as we go into water resources is water um, from the molecular scale to the global scale. Um, I'll, I'll just do the two extremes and I'll leave it to my colleagues to fill in the other scales. But one of the amazing things about water is its unique properties as a molecule and part of what makes it such an important part of the climate system. Um, this substance that we depend on for life, that we need for drinking, for growing our food, for processing our food, for hygiene, for healing, um, really is not just a passive element in the, in the Earth's climate system, it actually plays an active part. Um, so I want to briefly review how the unique properties of this molecule make it important in the climate system, and then some implications of that for, for water resources moving forward as the global climate changes. Okay, so as you know, well now here, here this is this is the water energy nexus you hear a lot about. Well, that's what climate is. Climate is the water energy nexus. And here we have the main energy source, um, of course, for our planet is the sun. The Earth is tilted and rotating and kind of lumpy and not perfectly shaped. And as a result, um, the heating is uneven. And it's uneven during seasons and between seasons. You know that. And you also know when is the Earth closest to the sun. Winter or summer? Very good. Okay, everybody here knows that. Um, so anyway, we set up a radiative imbalance. So the, here we have latitude on the axis here. And the, of course, the middle latitudes are getting more energy than they give back. And the higher latitudes are giving more back than they get. And this is an imbalance. And of course, nature affords an imbalance. And movements and transfers will go into effect to even this out. And here's just a graph of the redistribution of energy that has to be occurring to even that imbalance out on the global scale. Here we have latitude going from the North Pole to the South Pole. This heavy line is the total energy that has to be redistributed uh, across the globe to even out that imbalance. And the various dashed lines are the different ways that that energy is moved. Um, we talked about ocean currents earlier today. Warm water moving north, carrying, carrying energy north or south, poleward. Um, currents of air moving poleward and carrying sensible heat, something you can measure with a thermometer. But there's also this very important latent heat function of water. 
Water as a substance has a very high latent heat of phase change. You probably know that about water. It has to do with the hydrogen bonding, as many of the properties of water do. Um, so there's a lot of energy required to break the bonds between molecules. And that means that these latent heats are very high relative to other substances. And this means that this property of water plays an important part in the global heat rebalancing. So what does this mean for climate and water resources? Well, those systems, those storm systems, those swirly things that we see moving across the, uh, the TV set on the nightly weather, that is water, actually, being transported from one place to another, where it was evaporated, there was cooling, and then where it, it uh, condenses again, as rain or snow, heat is released. So not only are those uh, weather patterns bringing us water, they're also part of the Earth's redistribution of this uneven heat. So this makes water a store of energy, and it warms uh, its condensation site and cools at its evaporation site. Um, so we call that energy transport by latent heat. And here I just want to show a picture, of course, of all those, the water cycle in action, those swirling storms. Uh, of course, the white that you can see isn't water vapor. Water vapor is invisible. This is uh, condensed either ice or liquid water droplets in the atmosphere, but constantly in motion, constantly bringing the storms to you or not to you, just when you need them or don't need them. Um, in addition, because of the properties of the molecule, the hydrogen bonding, water has an extremely high thermal capacity. Um, so of course this represents the vibratory energy of the molecules, and as a result of this very high uh, heat capacity, it takes longer to warm water up than other things. So if we have a given heat input coming in, water will change by a certain amount, delta T, and dry soil will get twice as hot. Um, so as you can see, our land ocean differences are going to set up, again, gradients which will contribute to these motions and this redistribution of energy in the whole climate system. Um, if the soil is moist, the heat capacity uh, gets closer to that of water, so it doesn't heat up as much. Okay, global energy flow. So what I particularly want to call attention to in this picture is the role of water in this global energy flow. We have on our planet, um, the energy from the sun comes in as sh in shortwave radiation. Here we have the incoming solar radiation. Uh, some of it is reflected by clouds. So there we have water in its solid or liquid phase floating in the atmosphere. Uh, some of it then reaches the surface and either absorbed or reflected. What is the most reflective substance we have on the surface of the Earth? Snow. Um, snow. So if you have snow cover, then that is reflected out. When the snow cover goes away, you have a feedback effect. It gets warmer and there's less snow. And it warms more because less is reflected. Um, also a feedback effect with the clouds. Um, evapotranspiration is an exchange of energy. And then we have the thermal exchange here. Finally, the back radiation, and here's where the whole story of greenhouse effect and, and our whole CO2 um, climate change global, did I say global warming? Are we allowed to say global warming here? Okay, all right, good. Um, <laughs> where the whole story happens. So the Earth at a certain temperature radiates, um, the atmosphere also radiates, the molecules of gas in the atmosphere trap or absorb and emit long wave radiation, and then finally, long wave radiation is returned to space, so we have this balance. What comes in from the sun, what goes out is reflected, and what goes out is long wave. What we see, of course, going on is that this is increasing and this is increasing. Um, so it's an internal buildup, and we still are making a balance at the top of the atmosphere, but it's in uh, different wavelengths than it was before. Um, okay, so I like to ask my students, and actually I always ask this at one of my graduate student exams, what is the most important greenhouse gas? Water. Uh, <laughs> see, a bunch of scientists. The public will say carbon dioxide, because that's what they hear about. But water is, in terms of volume, uh, absorption, and emission, and its role in the atmosphere is much more important. And what's the scary thing about water as a greenhouse gas? We don't control it. Um, the atmosphere gets warmer, the, the uh, 
equilibrium concentration of water vapor gets higher, and we've got two thirds of this planet is covered with water in the oceans. The water just pumps into the atmosphere and it gets more and more absorptive. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if our models deal with that feedback effect totally just yet. Um, people are still working on that. Uh, okay, so again, here we see, whoops, the blue here is the absorption by water vapor in the atmosphere, um, and the orange is the total atmospheric absorption. So here in the long wave, it's really dominated by water vapor. Why do we care about carbon dioxide? Obviously because that is what we as humans have been pumping into the atmosphere, and we do have some control over it, supposedly. Okay, so this is a, again a rather complicated sketch of global water stocks in kilometers cubed and fluxes at average residence time. This is a picture that's going to change as, as the earth warms, the imbalance grows, more of these extreme events have to happen to move energy around and redistribute energy in the system. Um, we are probably going to see shorter residence times in the soil moisture in the biomass, um, shorter residence times in the glaciers, and the groundwater is still rather long residence time, um, less recharge to there. Uh, it's just going to totally disrupt this, this current balance in these exchanges. So more water in the atmosphere, even though it's a small amount of the total, and the residence time is very short, it's extremely important to climate processes. Okay, so what does this mean for resources? Resources are where we come in. This is a physical system that would, you know, do its thing without us. Uh, some people think it might do its thing better without us. Um, but we're here and we want to survive, so I don't have grandchildren yet, but I agree with those who do that this is something we should really care about. If you count up the total runoff from the continents, rivers, lakes, and groundwater, and this was done at a time when there were 7 billion people, as our count, Really, hey, there's plenty of water here. Uh, 6,700 6, cubic meters per year per person. And currently, even in developed countries where we're really, really using a lot of water, we're using a little more than a third of that. Um, global water withdrawal, so what's the problem? There's plenty of water. The problem is the distribution. Because it's unevenly heated, these patterns of distribution that bring the water, um, to our different locations, the climate system, the water patterns um, obviously are not evenly distributed. This is the United Nations map of water scarcity. And just don't want you to notice the orange and the yellow nations. Um, this is cubic meters per person and per year. And again, this is back in the, in the last decade. So some places not scarce, but are getting vulnerable. Some places very scarce. Here's a, a different view of the same thing. Um, again, notice where these areas of scarcity are, where the water stress indicator. Here's where our water resource uh, is overexploited, heavily exploited, and notice where those places are. Now we'll go to the climate change maps. Here's, um, let's see, this is from the fourth assessment, just some maps of temperature change, surface temperature change, warmer everywhere. Um, of course, warmer in the continents is showing them in the oceans. Um, this is the high growth scenario, low growth, moderate growth scenario, uh, getting warmer, and then with regard to water, predicted precipitation changes under future climate. Winter and summer. Where are the precipitation decreases? If you remember the pattern from the slide I showed you earlier, they happen to be in all those vulnerable places where people are already stressed, where the communities and societies are already stressed for their water resources. So what does climate change mean for water resources? First of all, I would like to say, and people have said this before, averages are meaningless. Um, I talked about the average amount of water per person per year. That's not very meaningful if you're in one of those bright orange places. Uh, the natural system is inherently variable, unpredictable. Our human settlements are somewhat unpredictable. I, I've been learning today about things like pests and pathogens. Uh, they're unpredictable too. Um, 
We have to assess and understand our changes regionally, but we still have to remember that the system is connected. And, and I would like to leave you with that as a hydrologist to remember that um, the system is connected and the system is not totally under our control, but we have to do what we can. So I will go to my next.
دیده ها رو دیگه بشید از یک کسی This is the Chesapeake Bay and this is the Chop Tank watershed. We start doing our modeling above the tidal line because it's because it's complicated to do the modeling. And then the way we calibrate these models are looking at the rainfall and a period that we are trying to test the model divided by two sections. Use the first, you know, one section for calibration and the other one for validation. And try to match the stream flows with the model and then that any pollution nitrate, phosphorus, sediment, whatever you, you're interested in. Uh, along the same line, we uh, were thinking that because of the climate, we need to extend the application of these models to much larger scale. So the only way we could do that is to bring some of the remote sensing uh, information into the model. And uh, like land use, uh, uh, the uh, ET, and other things that could be used from the remote sensing, so the model application not only applied to watershed, but much larger river basins. And uh, if you look at the, uh, this uh, South Fork watershed, we started two years ago to work on this watershed, it's about 16 times larger than the chop tank. So we are looking at the two different uh, remote sensing approach. One is the uh, using these Alexi models that was developed by uh, uh, on the top part of oops, on the top part of this slide, uh, this is what the SWOT model uh, right now calculated for uh, evapotranspiration. They have three different. Uh, equation for evapotranspiration, and then uh, there's also an option of uh, bringing those, uh, these ET from outside of the model. And then within the model, they can be the actual ET. So this limit our application of the model to a small scale. And if you go to the remote sensing and use the, these uh, two different options, one is the Alexi model that was developed by Martha Anderson and his colleague in our department. And the, uh, the other method is the NDVI and crop coefficient, which requires to have the energy tower uh, for ground producing of this method. So we are, I'm not going to go to do too much detail because I have only three, four minutes, but these two options would allow us to apply the model to much larger scale and look at uh, issues such as um, water management and uh, looking at the drought or regions that they were too, uh, too wet, and also the, uh, the state of the food safety, food uh, security and flood, you know, other issues that uh, are important. <coughs> so uh, our results so far is promising, and I think um, by using remote sensing, we can uh, extend the application of these models to, to river basin and even uh, continental uh, scales. Thank you.
the heart matters more than the head. And I always remember that because what it means, what his research found was that what people care about, what their values are, actually plays a much greater factor in determining their individual behavior than their environmental knowledge. So what I wanted to quickly talk about in my brief five minutes that I have um, is what are the reasons for involving communities and individuals in thinking about local watershed management and stormwater management? And how might we approach this? What are the different ways to involve people? I'll just show you some quick examples that some of the students did in landscape architecture. Um, and then lastly, thinking about what are the potential outcomes? How does public involvement then inform watershed design and planning and thinking about climate change? So first, quickly to recap some of the challenges in addressing stormwater management strategies. You know, one is the difficulty of passing along scientific knowledge. You know, we've sat through a number of really fascinating um, presentations today, but you, know, you all have, uh, you know, High levels of education, you've all been thinking about this for a long time. Um, but when you talk about asking people at the town and at the neighborhood level and even at the subwatershed level to make decisions about what to keep, what to not keep, given sea level change, given um, the facts, for example, that rivers in the Midwest are no longer draining, um, they've reached their capacity, asking people to take these very complex climate change models and think about impacts on the site scale and making decisions from that is very difficult. Um, you know, we saw um, John's presentation about people's attitudes about climate change and really thinking about how might we bring this closer to home. Um, and then related to that are looking at differences in perception between scientists and residents. Someone earlier today brought up, you know, what about citizen science? And obviously that plays a key role in looking at what is local knowledge versus um, trying to match that with what we know about climate change modeling and thinking about you know, all those different um, variations and what might happen at the local scale. Thirdly, taking into account the culture, the history, and the values. Thinking about, for example, the National Park Service having to reach a point saying, what are we going to keep, what are we going to lose? Because we're going to have, we only have so much money, there are only so many historical areas that we can save. So how does that play a role? And then lastly, thinking about, you know, there's been a lack of participatory pro uh, processes, a lack of civic involvement because these decisions are so complex. So that's sort of the framework that I'm coming from. This was a local project, and I can always talk to you more about this um, late afterwards if you'd like me to, but this is looking at Watts Branch Subwatershed in the Anacostia River. And so we were working with the local um, neighborhood association, Groundworks DC. And so the students sort of looked at all these different layers. They looked at the demographics, the de development layers, land use, economic drivers, and the Watts Branch of watershed, looking at where the culverts were, the public parks, the schools. Um, but then they wanted to involve the public. So they developed a very simple design game, looking at which outdoor activities do you like. Because they, as landscape architects, can come in and start to design stormwater BMPs. But what mattered was thinking about, okay, what are these other cultural layers, these other social layers, like recreation, that we can use as a guideline for some of our um, design responses, stormwater management responses. So you probably can't see this, but some of the top activities um, are actually water parks um, in terms of pop, um, popular recreation, biking and basketball, um, lounging at the field. Um, I'm still surprised at number four that this would come out in any public involvement, actually, so the place to play chess. Um, and I guess that just speaks to our area. Um, and then looking at, okay, here's some other design games. So then trying to pull out some more visuals, but actually showing people solutions. We've heard a lot of scary information, at least from my perspective, and you're like, goodness, you know, what's going to happen to people's grandchildren? How are people going to face these very real challenges that are looming? Um, but really giving, being able to use these participatory processes and some design solutions to give people hope, saying actually there are a number of possible solutions, there are a number of responses that we can start to look at. So these are just some of the design games that they're looking at, design approaches, green streets, stream restoration, <coughs> rain gardens, bias whales, you know, artistic um, approaches such as a neighborhood mural. Now these were sort of, you know, this is a very quick design game again, and so it's not statistically significant, but it was a quick snapshot of what the neighborhood residents like. So, I don't know if they were swayed by the students, but rain gardens came in first with Greenway seconds. second. Um, and this was just another design game, you know, thinking about what is their vision? What, you know, is their hope for, you know, what they might want to see in some of these open spaces? 
And these really vary between gardening, singing playgrounds, open space, paths, um, even vendors and water features. So again, these are some of the outcomes. Um, having interactive water features, interactive playgrounds, and sports fields. Um, and then my last slide is actually looking at, okay, how do we start to use this to inform our responses? And it really was a way to have a snapshot to identify and prioritize community needs, concerns, and preferences, as well as developing longer-term relationships with the neighborhood and community partners, which meant a lot to the residents there. And then lastly, determining how community and cultural needs, concerns, and preferences then inform stormwater management. Um, and, um, with that, I'll now turn it over to our, lab, our next speaker, Paul. Thank you very much. I'm actually going to build on what Vicky just talked about and uh, emphasize three main points today. The first one is that we need to think of watersheds as socio-ecological systems. Uh, the second one is that to do that we need to move away from discipline-specific research that focuses just on the technical or social components of watersheds alone. And the third one is that this approach is entirely consistent with our integrated research, extension, education approaches that we're all involved with in some way or another. So with that, of course, ecosystems, I'm actually going to move on to this slide. Um, watersheds really are signature socio-ecological systems because of these intrinsic two-way links between uh, water quality and human well-being. Our human activities affect water quality, often negatively, and of course water quality is vital for human function. And I'll actually emphasize two research projects uh, that will address socio-ecological dimensions of watersheds. As my colleague uh, Ali Sadiqi noted, uh, we can use hydrological models to, to model pollution transport within a watershed and then come up with a list of best management practices based upon environmental factors. Uh, what's ideal though is if we take the next step and also collect quantitative data on social factors using interviews, focus groups, uh, surveys, so that we can start to identify factors that may act as barriers to BMP implementation or factors that may actually facilitate BMP implementation. And if we can include that information into a, into a model, we can start to then filter out BMPs that may or may not be applicable for a given socio-economic context. And this is certainly work that my colleagues and I are doing currently, where we're starting to filter BMPs based upon socio-ecological context. We can also start to assess how certain education extension interventions affect changes in knowledge and attitudes, and how that affects uh, how we model long-term sustainability of watersheds. One education intervention that we're doing currently is collaborating with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and their Student Leaders Program that conducts bioassessments with residents within the state of Maryland. This is an ideal way that we're using a collaboration to engage our 4-H students, uh, to teach them about climate change and water resources uh, by monitoring uh, macroinvertebrates within streams. Uh, and of course, this sort of data, uh, DNR has got an extensive database of macroinvertebrate ecosystem health, uh, can be used uh, to compare to our model outputs. And it can complement traditional physical and chemical measures of water quality. So the other project I want to touch on, or a series of projects, actually involve disease-affected mosquitoes. Of course, many of you are aware that mosquitoes utilize standing water to develop them, and many of them are developed in above ground stormwater structures. So, uh, much of my work uh, is focused on looking at how we can minimize mosquito production from these structures, uh, as well as um, complement or emphasize their nutrient management capabilities. And of course, uh, mosquitoes are expected to us expand the distribution and abundance in the most climate change scenarios, especially as we talked earlier today about how we have a lot of variation and stormwater runoff, 
and that can lead to mosquito production potential disease risks. Uh, related to that though, interestingly, is that a lot of survey work uh, from myself and my colleagues identify that residents uh, perceive a real risk from installing stormwater structures in their backyards. But actually, they are bitten mainly by mosquitoes that don't breed in those habitats. Uh, water is often captured in anthropogenic containers. These containers hold water. Uh, and containers utilizing mosquitoes really pose the greatest threat to uh, humans along the eastern seaboard. Uh, and these containers can, can vary. They can be traditional stormwater structures that are subterranean. Uh, they can be the new wave of stormwater management techniques, such as uh, disconnected stormwater spouts. Uh, but uh, very often trash containers, trash receptacles that people have in their backyards and communities. And these can produce a range of mosquitoes, including, of course, the Asian tiger mosquito, which is a very important West Nile vector. And of course, the permanence of these habitats vary across different climate change scenarios. Uh, and once we start to identify some of these limits between how water is captured, how long it maintains within watersheds, and how uh, that may relate to mosquito production, we can start to make connections with human health in ways that we previously haven't. This is the focus of an NSF grant that myself and colleagues are involved in. We were really testing this hypothesis that urban decay leads to greater mosquito exposure, which in turn leads to positive feedback between mosquito pest elements, reduced use and valuation of the environment, and less care of the outdoor environment. And we're doing this work in Baltimore City, so I apologize, I'm actually moving into the cities here. But a similar kind of multidisciplinary model can be applied to agro ecosystems as well. And as a part of this project, we're also developing and evaluating passive and active education programs that involve citizen scientists and workshops, as well as traditional print education materials. And with that, I'm actually going to move on and hand over to the next speaker. Lifespans, if you would. 
Um, no, I'm going to integrate this into this diagnostic decision support system concept for uh, a couple of decades uh, with colleagues here and colleagues at uh, other locations as well. We've been developing these types of systems to help improve water quality and quantity in uh, watersheds of different types. The, the systems have three basic components. There's a special database that stores the information about areas of interest. There's uh, some one or more geologic models that are used to bring the behavior of an area of interest in response to rainfall, a design rainfall, or a time series of rainfalls measured uh, in the past. And then there's some expert systems that are used to uh, make some selection of fire sticks in those areas. The uh, models are used, uh, well, they're driven by those uh, rainfall statistics, and they're used to identify uh, local hotspots, especially localized areas which either have too much runoff generation, too much pollutant export, or a combination of those. And once we have this, uh, we run the uh, hotspots through our diagnostic expert system. The diagnostic expert system tries to figure out for each one of the identified hotspots of runoff generation or and export. Uh, what is the most likely cause, uh, the causes are here, for this to be a hotspot? Is it that the topography is too steep? Is it that the soil is too erodible? Is it that there's not enough cover on the land surface to prevent regrowth impact from detaching salt particles, for example? Once we have this uh, diagnostic, we move to uh, the second expert system, which is a prescription expert system. What it's going to do is to, for each one of the hotspots, based on the diagnosis that we found before, uh, identify appropriate BMPs that will cure uh, those identified and diagnosed problems for the hotspot. Once we have uh, BMPs, you know, site-specific BMPs for each one of the hotspots identified, then we'll go to the next step. The next step is rerun simulation, but this time uh, with the hotspots in place. And uh, we, well, sorry, with the best management practice in place. And what happens is we expect that you know we have solved all the environmental and <laughs> the water quality problems of the area. Uh, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, of course, uh, this is premised on having a appropriate design storm uh, or appropriate statistics that mean that the design. Mm -hmm that we've generated for best management practices over space is uh, going to be long-lasting. You know, we said it today and then 25 from now, it's 25 years away from now, it still works, it still keeps the water clean and in appropriate quantities. But um, what is being measured currently by NOAA, the new statistics that they're generating, uh, the, the most recent atlases that they've put together, which are for California and the Southwest United States, are starting to indicate that, oh, uh, rainfall statistics may be changing a little bit. Here in California, there's little uh, plus signs that indicate that the maximum one hour rainfall uh, is increasing, so the relatively short duration of rainfall. You get more rain uh, during shorter time periods. It may be 10 to 15 percent of, uh, of uh, stations that they sample, but it's statistically significant. Same thing for the southeastern state. And as NOAA goes on and updates uh, rainfall statistics for the Pacific Gulf, you might see more of this. And as we move forward in time, we might again see more of this. The statistics would be changing, and then we have to change the way in which um, we are putting our designs together. The laws quote unquote, would be changing on their feet. Um, the, uh, Diagnostic decision support system, its advantage over other approaches is that we can focus best management practice allocation development on just the hotspots. We have limited resources, it's very resource efficient as an approach. Um, however, climate change uh, makes us need to consider several new questions. For example, with climate change, uh, will these hotspots that we've identified, will they still be at the same location? Will they still have the same extent? Will runoff generation versus pollutant generation hotspots become differentiated, or will they merge over time? We don't know, and this is something that we need to be investigating. Also, the prescribed best management practices. 
Uh, we prescribed them based on just a fixed design storm or known uh, time series of measured data. Are, are these prescriptions going to be robust against the climate change if the climate goes in one direction or another over the next 25 years? Are these best management practices still going to be effective in the way that they were designed? Do we need to expand the area that they consider? Uh, if they're not, then we need strategies to increase their robustness, certainly. And because, you know, climate change and the climate, you know, is the future in particular, is rather uncertain, we probably need to uh, incorporate some uncertainty analysis types of techniques in the modeling that we're doing in the prescription, also in the prescription of the best management practices. So that we, you know, if we don't know which way the climate is going to go, we're going to probably widen the net a little bit. One last thing. <laughs> All right, some further questions. Um, will the cost of preventing climate change be more than adapting to climate change? I think prevention is the better idea here. Um, the cost of all the flooded land, reduced agricultural production, and so on, it is probably going to be much greater than that of prevention. And also, there's a question as to whether this climate is changing to go to a new normal, a new set of stationary statistics. Or if we're going to have a long-term non-stationary climate that just keeps changing uh, for a long time in terms of statistics, you know, over time. If, uh, if we're going through a new normal, it's easy to adapt our design and brainstorm to the new stats, uh, put that in the DDSS, and then we're done. If, on the other end, uh, we have long-term non-stationary, then this is better for us because then we're insured, we're guaranteed a job, you know, for, for a long, long time. So as you can tell, it has been a challenge to, uh, to get uh, us into the same time scale here. So uh, Jim, Liz, Jim, I think that, uh, okay, Jim, my time is, I know, five minutes, I got only five minutes. So I don't have, I was considering I'll give seven minutes, but that's okay. This is slide basically, uh, I think that summarizes my understanding of what has been talked. I agree with everything my colleagues have said and I'll definitely uh, esteem the keynote speaker this morning. Uh, this is Okalala Aquifer. Uh, basically, as you know, the problems of uh, the water table dropping down due to over excessive withdrawals. This is the very dry conditions in a portion of the world, somewhere that actually a person is with a pot trying to water the land. Uh, this is maybe Midwest where I got education on irrigation, uh, Nebraska area, and, and Midwest and, and so forth. Now actually it is more common in Eastern Shore, Maryland as well, Center Pivot. Uh, of course, we, we, you know, we heard about uh, from Dr. Don Bosch regarding the uh, ice melting glaciers, water table rise, and so forth. And these are high water table conditions. This is actually Fabry Dam of NRCS in eastern North Carolina, which water table management control drainage subrogation is conducted. So this summarizes really my understanding of types of challenges that we are dealing depending on the geographic location that we may be. Uh, in other words, we are communicating climate change really already, in my opinion. Uh, places that are dry, looking for water, which is scarce, and places that are wet, yes, they are putting up, using umbrella to keep the water away. Uh, so, we are also uh, looking at the pollution issue, that's as a stressor. You see water is getting polluted, uh, a beautiful landscape can be eroded, this is exaggerated, obviously, and, and a clean atmosphere can be with haze, as we might see, in, and we are seeing over ma major cities around the world. Uh, my colleague, uh, different colleagues, I think, all the way from Don uh, talk into uh, Kate Brubaker's, these uh, inter sort of uh, processes that, that go on between, I would call different spheres, atmosphere, uh, lithosphere, uh, maybe hydrosphere, and, and of course the cryosphere, the, and, and so forth, and all the basically water circulation and energy circulation in between, it is basically creating types of currents and climatic conditions that we are actually facing and, and the extreme events, whether it is drought or flooding conditions or uh, hurricanes and, and so forth that has been intensified in recent years. 
Dr. Jack Meissen from ARS, during the lunch break, he mentioned that we need to put these in perspective of a little bit of statistics, frequencies, how frequently they occur. I think that's a very good point to, uh, to consider. And I think Dr. Monte has mentioned that the statistics and variability within the PMP designs, that whether PMP that we are designing based on two year, uh, you know, one hour storm, but it is valid for a storm that is going, the same storm always, all of a sudden it's going to be converted to come in one year and, you know, half an hour time, uh, so the more intense. Uh, and then, in terms of the, uh, you know, demographic change, uh, surface area, about, uh, uh, you can see, this is from National uh, Resource Inventory, basically, uh, we have cropland, which is about 80% of the other land uses in here. Uh, total surface area is about, uh, let's see, 1.938 billion acres. It's not comma, it should be done. Uh, all right, and then urban development. We have uh, development that has increased to 111, uh, basically, million acres, uh, uh, which, is, which is a drastic increase in urban development. That is, uh, you know, we, we also saw the urban sort of impact on temperature rise and, and so forth, challenges that actually is creating and, and exacerbating the climate change issues. As Dr. Bosch mentioned, that is that man-made? Uh, well, uh, I think we as human beings, we are affecting that. I sit in my car every morning alone and drive all the way from Colombia to College Park and back. I feel bad every day that why I'm supposed to. We don't have public transportation system that I can drive. So yes, indeed we do. And this is Millennium Assessment, uh, Ecosystem Assessment, that basically uh, is saying that more land was converted to cropland in the 30 years after 1950 than in the 150 years between 1700 and 1850. Again, that's from at least agroecosystem point of view, that's types of stressors that we need to consider. Population dynamics, uh, this is my favorite uh, sort of slide that I, I use often, but look at this, 10,000 years ago we had only 10 million population. In 1850, we had 1 billion, and as you saw earlier, so we passed about two years ago, we passed 7 billion mark, and we are heading to uh, 9 billion in 2050. So those have been mentioned, and this is a little bit of fact about on water issues. Uh, one thing that I want to uh, mention is basically uh, more than 70% uh, of water actually, somewhere I had said, is used uh, by agriculture. So because of all these uh, sort of uh, water uh, needs, scarcity, lack of fresh water for major population in the world, uh, we actually have to rely on high cost technologies such as desalinization, reuse, and conservation strategies. So we can do a lot with this. We can definitely use this, and, and some research is going on. Desalinization is taking place, but I have to tell you that those are expensive. Um, and just, just again, uh, I, I don't want to repeat, but this is sort of showing the precipitation march to May. I just wanted to show you that in the last 100 years, and most of it is really the last 30 years, precipitation in the state of Maryland has increased basically in, during the March, uh, April, and May months when we need to go to the land and do uh, crop uh, seedbed preparation and cropping. And then uh, next slide basically shows uh, June through July, which is going down, and you can see that that's when crop is growing. We need water for the crop. That's why, yes, the, the economic value, the food quality is one incentive for farmers to put irrigation, let's say in temperate zones such as Eastern Shore of Maryland, but on the other hand, it is need. There has been so uneven distribution of precipitation and, and lack of it that that actually has caused, pushed them to do that. And this is sort of summary of those graphs. Uh, Dr. Bosch showed that on the average IPCC about 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit increase. In Maryland, I found from National Weather Service data, it is 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about the same 0.9 tenths of a centigrade increase in temperature. Uh, again, every month on the average has increased, and this precipitation you see that in spring and during the summer it is negative. Uh, so those really uh, call for some watershed strategies, and this is basically irrigated water withdrawal. You can see that all these high bars are for agriculture. I'm not going to, do, to go into the detail. That means we have a lot to do. Terry Howell from AUSDA ARS uh, uh, in Texas, who has worked extensively on water use efficiency. I recommend you if you are working on water management uh, areas, definitely look at that paper. Uh, oops. Uh, one of my PhD students, Kalim Hanna, and I worked on uh, irrigation economics decision support system in conjunction with SWOT model that my colleague uh, Alice Aligi mentioned uh, for, again, Maryland conditions that 
when you irrigate, what does that do to the cycling of nitrogen and phosphorus, and as a result, discharge of water in terms of quality and nitrogen and phosphorus discharge at the output of the water? Because biocycling, due to irrigation, you can change that because soil moisture is changing. Mineral demineralization, mineralization, some of those uh, components of things. Yeah, sustainability, again, this is something that we need to pay attention, but I want to read this. Considering the status of today's world regarding poverty, inequality, global warming, lack of ecosystem, human health in many parts of the world, and water scarcity, sustainability loses dictionary meaning. Meaning that we really, that's a challenge for us to meet. And we have had lots of meetings, uh, and we have, by the way, besides this, uh, we are planning on to having uh, American Society of Health and Biological Continuum 2015 in Chicago. We have a symposium on climate change. These are some research needs that one of the things that I'm basically saying is that we have to look at the things in systems level, look at all the connect basically climate models with our landscape models, bring them to the scale, manageable scale, management units that each one of us have impact on our farmstead level and, and so forth to convert them. Uh, so, and, and we basically build models that basically connects all those spheres that I had mentioned in here, so I don't have time. But uh, Charlie this morning uh, mentioned the report, and I'm basically referring to research needs and research challenges that were outlined in that report. I think that's an excellent uh, reference to, to refer to. And uh, with that, uh, let's see, uh, just a couple of quotes in here. Nelson Mandela says basically, let there be work, bread, water, and salt for all. Water is the driving force <coughs> of all natural, Leonardo uh, de Vinici. And water is taken in moderation, does not hurt anybody. Mark Twain. And of course, uncertainty and so forth that my colleague mentioned and Martin, these are parts of things that for sustainability we need. So thank you very much for your attention. And with that, we have our some few minutes for questions, Jim, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry that our panel was supposed to finish at 1.15, but. Uh, we, we, okay, go ahead. Okay, okay. So, uh, so anyway, uh, but we are ready to take any questions that you may have for uh, my esteemed colleagues here. So they'll answer. I know that I won't be able, but they will. Yes. You have you have the mics in there, maybe. Uh, Depends on what we uh, consider shortage in where, in my opinion. Okay? So if you if you are thinking about water shortage in Eastern Shore, Maryland, right now we have plenty of food. Right now. Okay? But the important thing is that when you pump that water, uh, especially from uh, aquifer system, you bring it onto the surface, contaminate it, and recharge at least some of it, or discharge it into a stream system that affects our aquatic system, then, you know, quickly, if we do calculations, we realize that it is not sustainable, what we are doing. So, in fact, as part of that economics research that uh, I mentioned by PhD students and I did, we actually looked at uh, putting price for the water. So, in fact, if the price of water is zero, I'm not here lobbying for price, you know, sell the water and so forth, but I want to make a point in here. And that is, we checked actually different irrigation methodologies, drip irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, flood irrigation, uh, single gun, and so forth. And plus, versus different crops, sorghum, corn, you know, different values of crops, okay? So when the basically price of the water was zero, then these uh, in not inefficient, I would say less efficient irrigation systems were economically very viable, even for sorghum, which is a low value crop in terms of marketability. Okay? But as soon as you put water value for the water, price for water, then you realize that actually the irrigation system with all the expensive initial costs, it became more economically feasible in overall, basically, farm economic system. So I know that I'm talking about economics, but what I mean is if you are looking at how scarce it is right now, basically fresh water in the world, according to the statistics that I look, it can only sustain 2 billion population. But we, are, we have nine billion, 7 billion right now and growing. So that means we really are already 
we have already passed the threshold, as uh, as uh, uh, Herman Daly uh, mentions, that uh, in terms of economics, that if we relate everything that we consume to uh, natural resources, we already have surpassed that threshold. So, so it depends on what scale and where we are talking about. Excuse me. That was my answer. Since it was about aggregation, I thought. Any other questions? There are some questions there. Sugar Hamptons. Oh, he's speaker. That's too small from the USDA. <clears throat> uh, I thought it was really interesting, uh, in your talk, you said that this is one system we don't we have no control over the amount of water. And, and I know that for a fact because I was trying to plant a barbecue this summer, <laughs> and I couldn't get an accurate prediction of when it would rain. Uh, and I'm told about eight, ten days off from my barbecue, right? Mm -hmm. So in no short term, we don't have great weather prediction, and everyone knows that from watching weather channels. We also don't know when we're going to have a year of drought, right? <clears throat> and we really can't predict that. So my question is, since a lot of these models are, are, are driven by episodic events like this one, like a one day, one hour, rainfall event, and, and, and we really can't predict long-term uh, precipitation events like a year of drought, what scale do we need to nail down precipitation models to, or, or estimates of precipitation to actually be able to really move forward with understanding uh, what, we're, what we're in for? Like, how accurate are we historically? Because you look at the averages and you have to go down or up, but it almost seems like we have to be able to predict on a much finer time scale over long periods of time to make the model, models more accurate. So on what scale are we missing? Um, I'm not sure exactly. I think one of the things we're missing is interaction among scales. Um, how I mean, we have a lot of the, the things that control how water behaves in the atmosphere are pretty much at the at the micro level, the droplet or the, the crystal uh, microphysics, and those things have large implications for patterns and, and response. Um, I I was told you shouldn't trust the weather forecast for five days in advance. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just a mathematically chaotic system. It's subject to uncertain to initial conditions and it drifts. So we just we can't predict it accurately mathematically weather or climate. But I think so then how do you run the model? Pardon? How do you run the model? Run the model. Oh. How do you run like a watershed model? Um, well it's it's always considered an estimate. And when we do these um, designs and we have our five year, twenty four hour rainfall, we know that's an estimate of an unknown population. Um, it's the best we have. And well, what engineers tend to do is slap a big factor of safety on it uh, because so many things are at stake. Um, maybe uh, maybe some of the other panelists can answer that better than I can. I, I I I'm a modeler. I love models. I believe in mathematics, but um, there are some things we just can't predict perfectly. Maybe about one thing. Uh, well, I believe in the laws of physics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it could be changing. <laughs> At some level, certainly, you know, we can do more long-term predictions with the larger time steps. You know, it's based on how long we're we're willing to wait for the predictions. Right? And if we use very fine time steps to get a very high time accuracy in the future predictions that the model provides, then we're going to have to do it a longer time. So we use, in this case, uh, possibly design storms with those very fine time steps. It's a scale issue. It goes back to, I think, what you were um, asking about. What kind of precision or accuracy do we need in our models? And so longer term, our currency is certainly less accurate. The uh, shorter term, short time frame models are probably more accurate. And I guess the research is ongoing to try to make you know the, what is going on in terms of uh, long term prediction models uh, if not as accurate as the short term ones, at least to more accurate than they are currently, we're going to get accurate weather forecasts uh, for maybe two weeks in the future. What do you think? What about the farm? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I just want uh, to make a comment, and that is there is a, there is a model jute called Kvijen, which is used actually in association with SWAT model that Ali referred to, and it has been uh, Arlen Nix uh, of ARS, who has passed since, since then, he had developed this. It is basically you can forecast rainfall with that model for the locations that you don't have rainfall data. And you can basically forecast using for your series in the future. Now, having said that, just like any mathematical model, it is, it is uh, uncertain based on the parameter values that you're using. So if you can put a band of uncertainty and use that precipitation that is predicted in this mathematical model in your, let's say, volition assessment models, and, and let that uncertainty also affect the output uncertainty of the model and describe that in those terms, then for managers they can make decisions based on some risks associated with that uncertainty. So we have the method. We can forecast the rainfall into the future and current for the locations that there is not model. So in fact it is the ARS model, the that we use in association with other models. Any other questions? Hi, I'm Jeff. Ben Rosenfeld, also from ARS. Uh, I had a similar question, but more about the sociological and political implications of the tremendous variance that we keep seeing in slide after slide. Your, your slide about what's happening seasonally in Maryland was a great example where we, we have a very decided movement in the mean, but the variance around that mean is so huge that perception uh, in real time it would be very difficult you know, for anyone experiencing those years of change to perceive the, the, the movement in the mean. And unless, um, unless people and then their politicians uh, need to feel um, the, the big movement, it's hard, hard to imagine that we're going to get much progress. So uh, I was very uh, much enjoyed the first talk. And I will be thinking a lot about how water and energy are kind of intrinsically bounded. And it seems like we have a very powerful uh, prediction for generally what will be happening in the globe or even in particular regions. Um, but the, I've noticed that after every disaster, some scientists or group of scientists has asked, can you attribute that hurricane or that typhoon or that flood event to uh, climate change. And I'm just wondering what, you know, where the panel feels the field has gotten in terms of attribution uh, statistics so that one can say, um, we think that 80% uh, you know, of this last storm is probably uh, attributable to these global trends. That is a great question. I, one of the things I found has been helpful in, in my work and, and as an educator um, is to, to use an analogy that weather is like a mood and climate is like a personality. Um, and some, somebody may have a kind of personality where they're just, you know, going like crazy back and forth. If you see that person for the next couple of months and they're just, you would say that their personality had changed. Or if you know somebody who kind of was up and down and mostly sweet and then all of a sudden started to go crazy, you would say their personality had changed. So I think that that's useful to people to think about it that way. Um, has, has the personality changed, not just the mood? So the fact that, we, that, this, that this swung into this huge manic episode or this huge depression um, is much worse swing than we would have expected under the last personality, and so we think, yeah, that, that something's changing here. Um, I don't know if that's standard climatological speak, but I find it very useful as an analogy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just, just a quick comment. I think uh, when we're engaging with non-scientific stakeholders, of course the big challenge is that it's really that we can convince them about climate change with statistics. So I think going back to Don Bosch's point earlier today, we really need to integrate climate change education into curriculum quite early on uh, so that people are exposed to these ideas as, as youth and are much more receptive of them um, than, than, of course, people that are much older and who aren't 
impacted by climate change on a daily basis. We see through our work on Deal Island and Dorchester County, those people that are facing sea level rise really do believe in climate change because they can measure it in their own backyard. Uh, but those people that aren't impacted on a daily basis aren't. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's give a hand to our panel here.